and welcome to a new episode of a flat pack history of sweden i'm elsa and i'm chris and this is episode 28 50 years and 10 reigns Ooh. and spoilers not all of these reigns have that much information on them so don't expect that this will be a 15 hour episode just because we have 10 kings to talk about or actually 10 reigns, because it's more than one reign for some of the kings, which is a bit of a spoiler. Oh, yeah, true that, true that. But shall we do our Swedish phrase of the week first? Yes, I think we should. Tell us what it is. So this week's phrase is Allt går utom små barn och tinsoldater. Okay, so that means everything walks apart from children and tin soldiers yeah exactly but for the phrase to make sense we should know that the verb gör in swedish both means to walk and to make something happen to get it done so this phrase yes literally means everything walks except small children and tin soldiers but its meaning is oh well everything can be done except for a few things in this case like well everyone can walk except small children and tin soldiers and when would you use that as a phrase so you use it as a phrase when you didn't expect that something would be doable but it was so like when kennedy said let's go to the moon and yeah. then nasa were like what how are we going to do that? <laughs> but then they went to the moon and you could say, well, everyone can go to the moon except small children and tin soldiers. The phrase is used as a confirmation that something could be done. So when they saw Neil Armstrong on the moon, Kennedy could say, well, everything is doable. Allt går utom små barn och tin soldater. From the grave, because he was dead by then. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> but yes, okay. Talking about a dead president, I think we should talk about some long dead Swedish kings instead. We really should. We really should. And there's a few of them. So, uh, yeah. Get your thinking caps on and uh, maybe get a piece of paper to note down all these kings as we go through them, because some of them won't be around for very long. You know, or don't. We don't require that much engagement from you listeners. You know, if maybe you're listening to this while you're driving. If you are, don't get pen and paper out. No, get your passengers to do it for you. But yeah, so this week we're going to start to see the relative stability that came with Eric Segersel's mini dynasty come to a pretty much an abrupt start stop after it slows down a bit with a first king and then immediately runs into a brick wall and uh, all falls apart quite quickly. Whilst there's definitely a strong thread of continuity throughout both of this episode and the rest of the High Middle Ages, it is much more of a roller coaster than a smooth segue ride through the period that we've kind of experienced up until this point, not counting the wars with Denmark and Norway and things like that, but internally in Sweden it starts to become a lot more rocky. As we've touched on before, the crown wasn't necessarily directly inherited through a royal family, although the precedent is starting to be there. It tends to pass to those who happen to be the most powerful in one or both of the main regions of Sweden at this time. By default, a lot of these people are related in some way to the previous king, but it's not a necessary thing. No, and we will also see this week that in this period, the calm nature of the succession of the Hrothkonung period, like Chris said, begins to relapse somewhat, with some kings reigning in Vestergötland, one part of Sweden, whilst pretenders or rivals will be in control of other parts of the country, mainly Svealand, which is more to the east. Before Erik Segersel, there were many petty kings, if we can call them that, throughout what is now Sweden. Remember in Anskar's episode when he came to visit local leaders like Björn in Birka? They called themselves kings of that particular area, with some of them perhaps reigning over areas that could have been as large as all of Svealand, but they never united with other kingdoms elsewhere. 
Yeah, so no one was ever in charge of one, more than one or two of these petty kingdoms. So it isn't until Olof Werkung takes charge of both of these places and consolidates his leadership through his minting of coins and all of that business that someone can start to legitimately claim to be the king of most of what is now Sweden. And if for some reason you're listening to this and haven't listened to Olof Werkung's episode and the background of him, definitely go and give that a listen because uh, that gives a lot of good context to what we're talking about today. Olaf Wörtkonung's successors have to be elected king in each of these various regions in Sweden, mainly Vestjutland and Svealand. They aren't automatically linked to these two titles. Mm. The Svealand kingdom is the one which gives their rulers more of a right to the name King of Sweden, and seems to be the primary area of the country, at least when it comes to the naming conventions of the rulers. So if you're King of Svealand, you're probably going to be elected King of Sweden, but you might not necessarily be the King in Vesterjotland at the same time, as they aren't linked by law. And... I hope that makes sense because it's relatively important for this episode. Yeah, I think m maybe to help visualize it, if you're listening to this and you have access to Google or something, you can look up where these regions are on a map and sort of see, yeah, that they weren't, like Chris was saying, weren't directly linked at the time. Even though they are next to each other, <laughs> the political systems aren't linked. So this dual system means that in this episode we'll see a lot of back and forth with the crown and some periods where the king of Sweden doesn't even have full control over one of these two main areas. A bit like how Arnold Jakob was still king of Sweden despite Knut for a period ruling over some of the territory in Svealand like Sigtuna. That in itself gave Knut the right to call him the king of some of the Swedes. It is a bit complicated, especially with the names of the regions and the countries not necessarily correlating to their modern day equivalents, but it hopefully is easy enough to follow as we go. So it is this federation style of kinship in Sweden that really returns with a bang as there's a lot of disputed succession within this period. Yeah, so to sum it up, leaders have independent control of primarily Svealand and Västergötland, and usually the person uh, with control over both is the person that gets known as King of Sweden. So with that in mind, shall we get going with our first guy? Yes, let's begin. So this is in 1060 when uh, Edmund den Gamla or Edmund den Slemma, the <laughs> slimy guy, has died. My favourite name so far. Yes, but... Going against everything we've just said, the first succession in this period is actually one that's quite unanimous and without drama. So enter Stenkil, or Stenshil, as he was probably more properly pronounced in Swedish and back in the day. Yeah, Swedish has this horribly difficult ch sound in a lot of words. Uh, Stenshil is uh, one of the trickier ones perhaps to pronounce if you're not a native. So, in the last episode, King Eamund was visited by Adelverd the priest, if you remember. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was surprised to find a fake archbishop living in Sigtuna taking up his job. So, uh, after being turned back towards Germany, Adelvard was escorted out of Sweden by a man called Stenkil. And he was a local leader, politician, and potentially a minor noble who was actually married to Eamund den Slemma, the slimy guy's daughter. Mm. This Stenkil, presumably in part to his family connections to Emund and his local political power, is elected king in Vestergötland and also Svealand in 1060 when Emund dies and thus becomes king of Sweden. Excellent. And the Hevara saga has a great deal to tell about Stenkil, so I'll just quote that here. There was a great man of noble family in Sweden called Stenkil. His mother's name was Astrith, the daughter of Njal, the son of Finn the Squinter from Halogaland, and his father was Rungnvald the Old. Stenshil was an earl in Sweden at first, and then after the death of Emund the Old, the Swedes elected him their king. Then the throne passed out of the line of the ancient kings of Sweden. Stenshil was a mighty prince. 
he married the daughter of King Eamund. He died in his bed in Sweden about the time that King Harold fell in England. So a bit of spoilers there about how he's going to go and the fact that he doesn't last too long uh, because this reference to the time that King Harold fell in England, that is Harold Hardrada dying in 1066 in England. So that means that Steinschild only gets six years in charge of Sweden. Yes, and when it mentions the throne passing out of the line of ancient kings of Sweden, that's talking about Olaf Kvartkonung's family. Can I also just say something that I, when I read this, I reflected upon? He died in his bed. That's not worth mentioning. No, it is, because that implies he didn't die in battle, and so therefore he wasn't murdered or pushed off a cliff or anything. Yeah, I suppose so. It's just a bit, you know, I read that, I was like, yeah, that's where most people die. Well... Oh, like, a bit of a... Nah. It means he wasn't murdered in these sort of sagas and chronicles and uh, things. I don't think it doesn't necessarily mean he did die it physically in his bed. I think it's more of a euphemism. As opposed to in battle being pierced by 15 swords. Yeah, or stabbed with a thousand swords. Oh yeah, well that makes sense. I thought the whole I died in bed was a bit boring, but it's I suppose it's actually quite important information. And adding to this information, going against the Havara saga slightly, Adam of Bremen, who is actually alive at this point, and therefore now truly a contemporary source, says that Stenshiel was maybe the nephew or stepson of Eamund, while the Harava saga says that, as we mentioned, he was related to the previous dynasty by marriage to Eamund's daughter. So, either way, he isn't a direct son of Eamund, which is the main point. And so, therefore, it is moving out of this direct line of succession at best, and he's completely unrelated to the male line at worst, mm. so to speak. Some historians have suggested that Stenshiel was probably from Vestergötland rather than Upland or the Lake Melleran area or anywhere else in Sverland. They point out that the short list of Swedish kings, which is added to this Vestergötland lore of the 1200s that we've mentioned quite a few times, mm -hmm. and we will mention many times in this episode, it says that he spent a lot of time in Levana in Vestergötland, where he was long remembered as the king who loved those from Vestergötland before all his other subjects. So it implies he has a bit of favouritism for yeah. that, even if he didn't live there. A, f a fair bit, I'd say. Yeah, true. Coincidentally, he was also praised as a great archer whose accuracy was lauded by everyone. So that's a bit of a nice detail if we want to believe that. Indeed, that's cool. Always cool to be a good archer. Now, as we mentioned, we don't have too much information on the kings for this episode. Steinschild is the one that we perhaps have the most about. Two themes have survived the ages when it comes to Sweden during this time. Unsurprisingly, one is to do with the church, and the second, which is not at all shocking, has to do with wars with Norway. Out of those two main strands, shall we start with the church? Yeah, I think so. Stenshiel is praised as a devout Christian, but also was slightly more pragmatic than some of his more institutionalised Christian kings of the time, as he was quite accommodating towards the old pagan religion which, where it was found around in Sweden. This sets up a fair amount of bother for some of his successors, as his treatment of the pagans is used as a stick to beat these successive kings when they try and remove the pagans. They come back and say, mm -hmm. oh, you're not being nice to us like Stenshiel was, and so that causes a lot of drama, not for Stenshiel himself, but for people coming yeah. later on. It's partly in relation to Christianity that we first saw Stenshiel during the reign of Emund and Slemma. At that time, he was the person providing support and protection for Adelverd's delegation back to Bremen after they'd been turned away by King Eamund and his fake Archbishop Osmundus. So I just think it's very good that we once again mention this about the fake Archbishop. If our listeners aren't familiar with it, listen to our last episode. It's, it's just a really great story. And it's an excellent story. And so when Stenshiel becomes king... He then supports the Christianization of Sweden and seems to have worked well with the priests and bishops sent from the archbishopric down in Hamburg and Bremen. With the help of Steinschild, Adelvard, remember he actually returned a few years later when uh, Eamund relented and let him come back, but when Steinschild is now king, 
he creates the Sigtuna bishopric, which we briefly touched on our episode when we were walking around the town. Yeah, we did. It had previously had churches, of course, but now Sigtuna gets a bit of a promotion and gets its own bishop. Being just one day's journey from the old cult center at Uppsala, this, perhaps unsurprisingly, starts a bit of a conflict as the two religions start to butt heads once again, and particularly with the two centers, Sigtuna with the bishop and Christianity, and Uppsala being so close to each other. The next part of this is heavily debated and comes from Adam of Bremen. So we take it with a pinch of salt, but Uppsala was the site of Sweden's most famous pagan temple. And this was a place where sacrifices of humans and animals were supposedly performed every ninth year. Naturally, this doesn't really fit in with the Christian teachings of the time. Or any time. Or I suppose, yeah, contemporary Christian teaching as well. So after having formally converted the rest of the population around Sigtuna, Adelwald suggested, along with Bishop Egino down in Skåne, that they should team up and destroy and burn down the temple at Uppsala once and for all. And presumably they hoped that seeing as they were Christian missionaries, they would be able to get away with this somehow, maybe being protected by God or something. But I think they're forgetting the fate of the last priest who went in and smashed up an icon of Thor in the middle of the Ting meeting. And he was pierced with a thousand wounds and mocked after he was thrown in the lake, which he found yeah. amusing. Um, uh, I mean, I think Stenshiel actually has quite a clever attitude having this more sort of live and let live attitude to the remaining pagans in Sweden. But yeah, these bishops want to go in and hit hard yeah and we presume that they had hoped that burning down the temple would either result in their martyrdom if they failed and were murdered in the act or if they succeeded that example would help to convert the rest of the pagan population to christianity i mean it's known as a win-win situation if you're a christian missionary in the 11th century then yeah can't go wrong really that's true because adam says that they would willingly undergo every kind of torture for the sake of destroying that house which was the seat of barbarous superstition. But luckily for the stability of the kingdom, as also said, Stanshiel has this very pragmatic view of things and he seems to have realised that this would have been a pretty terrible idea to foster peaceful relations within his kingdom. So he knew a lot of people in the area were either still pagan or at least respected the ancient traditions of their people enough to not want their history and culture to be burnt to the ground right in front of them. Indeed, and so Stenshiel manages to convince bishops Adelvard and Egino that they would surely be murdered before burning down the temple, and then the nearby Christians would either revert to paganism through losing their bishops, or because the pagans would force them to, so they stood a lot to lose. Stenshiel was also worried that these pagans would then go on a bit of a rampage against all Christians in general, and especially him as a Christian king who was helping to spread the religion, he would be targeted. So perhaps wisely, the bishops reluctantly decided to follow Steinschild's advice. Uh, instead, they headed west to Westergötland, which was, as we've seen before, less resistant to efforts of conversion. Funnily enough, Adam of Bremen then says that they broke any pagan idols they found, making thousands of converts in the process. So, yeah, quite the drama for everyone involved, really. Uh, there isn't any backlash for this smashing of idols, so perhaps they were doing that in areas where people were less hardcore pagans. Yeah, it was an easier target than the temple of their yeah. whole religion. Um, Adam describes Stenshiel as quite a God-fearing and pious leader, but also with this practical and pragmatic side. More amusingly, the Icelandic manuscript Morskinskirna, written in the 1200s a few decades later, says that 
King Stenshiel was a portly man and heavy on his feet. He was much given to drinking parties and not much involved in the business at hand. He himself liked to be left in peace. It describes so many Swedish men to this day that I know <laughs> I think that could be a pretty accurate description of a lot of people. No comment from me uh, on that one. <laughs> It's probably this liking to be kept in peace bit that meant he really did want to stop any fighting that would have come out of the Christians and pagans butting heads at Uppsala. But either way, it worked. And uh, as an aside, Adam of Bremen also notes at this time that certain persons in Bishop Adelvard's company told us that when he first came to Sigtuna, 70 marks of silver were placed in his hands as oblations at one celebration of mass. So great, indeed, is the devotion of all the people of the Arctic region. At that time, also, he was on a journey when he turned aside to Birka, which now was turned into such a wilderness that scarcely a vestige of the city was visible. Poor Birka, this this place that meant so much uh, in uh, Viking time, Sweden has now all but gone. Yeah, and they're just going there as a tourist to see the site where Ansgar and people used to visit, and uh, yeah, it's now completely gone, pretty much. That's pretty sad. Mm. This is pretty much it when it comes to relations between Stenshiel and the church. Uh, the rest of what we know about his reign relates to wars he was involved in. For once, it's not wars with Denmark. This time, it's with the Norwegians. It's nice to share the love. <laughs> of the war. If we look back to the last episode, we saw that near the end of Arn and Jakob's reign, Magnus the Good of Norway dies, leaving his Norwegian throne to Harald Hardrada but leaving his Danish throne to Sven Estridsson. Those two keep up a war all until the end of Arnund's life and all through Eamund's reign. Eamund doesn't seem to have been actively involved in this war, but that ends in 1064 once Steinschiel is ruling Sweden. Exactly. The war between the two neighbours of Sweden had been bubbling along for quite a while at this point, for over 15 years in fact. Nobody seems to be able to quite land that killing blow, and it goes up and down in intensity over the years. A few years there doesn't seem to be anything happening at all, but they still hate each other. It's in 1064 and 1065, as also said, that Sweden gets dragged into this conflict for a while. The sagas tell us that this conflict revolves around a man called Håkon Iverson, a Norwegian military leader who was married to King Magnus of Norway's daughter Ranghild, and who followed Harald around on all of his campaigns against the Danes. According to Snorri Sturluson's Heimskringler, the Norwegians won a big victory at the Battle of Nissor in 1062, but Håkon had secretly allowed the defeated Danish king Sven to escape alive, and naturally, when Harald Hardrada finds this out, he was pretty annoyed and told his men to kill Håkon. Oh, for someone who's annoyed, that's a harsh way of being annoyed. He's helping his enemy in war. That's kind <laughs> of understandable. I can imagine that this would have been seen as quite a betrayal. Hilkon knew things wouldn't end well for him, so he decides to escape to Sweden. Steinschild seemed to appreciate this military man coming to him, as not only did he welcome him, but he also made him Jarl, or Earl as we'd say in English, of the Swedish province of Värmland. Meanwhile, Norway and Denmark signed a peace treaty later in 1064, presumably so that Harald could concentrate on chasing after Helkon and getting his revenge. And that's just what he did, uh, invading Sweden and proceeding to harry it, uh, which is this lovely odd term for just pillaging, stealing and setting fire to things. And this happens throughout Götaland, uh, the western and central parts of Sweden, very much the heart of Sweden at the time. Steinschild was naturally a bit worried about such a development, and so he arranged a meeting with Sven and asked him for his support against Norway. Sven reluctantly replied that he couldn't break his peace treaty with Norway 
literally right after signing it. But he recommend that Stenshiel make Håkon a sort of uh, official sub-ruler of Västergötland from where he could raise more forces to fight back against the Norwegians. Because he's such a great military leader and he also knows Harald Hardrada really well. So it kind of makes sense in that in that way that um, you use your enemy's enemy as sort of the main fighter in this war. Yeah. Håkon was given this title and then spent some time assembling an army. He supposedly raised men from Sweden, but also from Denmark. There's a bit of a fun quote from him, which is almost certainly not true, but it is fun nonetheless, so I'm going to read it out. Uh, speaking to his troops, he supposedly said, Even though I have a lesser title than King Stenshiel, it may be that I will be of no less assistance. For he is used to an easy life, while I am accustomed to battles and hard conditions. Well, that does seem to fit that portly man who doesn't like any drama <laughs> description of Stan Shear. Yeah. But yeah, whether he would actually say this to his men, that's a bit, uh, a bit unlikely, perhaps. But according to all of the various sagas that mention this battle, Harald Hardrada raised this fleet and invaded Sweden in the depths of a very cold winter, which is quite surprising at the time. Sailing through the rivers that weren't frozen over yet, mainly the Jörte River, he reached Lake Vernon, where they headed east, because the lake is huge, there's uh, yeah. more than one main area of it. So they entered the eastern area of it, which is where Håkon's troops were gathered. Helping the Swedes and Håkon to, to gather these troops was the Lagman, or the law speaker, sort of the yeah governor, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, man in charge of Vestergötland, a man called Thorvid. He apparently wasn't that confident of victory <laughs> though, because as soon as he saw the Norwegians arrive, he got scared and ran away. But he was probably a bit right to be a bit worried, because the sources say that the Swedes were only lightly clothed, as they tended to be at the time, whilst Harold had more men who actually wore armour and had a lot more equipment. So, despite Håkon's experience in battle, this Swedish army was defeated, but Harald decided not to chase the Swedes as they were running away, so he sort of missed an opportunity to f finish them off for good. He then gathered his men on the shores of Lake Vernon, but it was then when they were apparently led into a trap where they were ambushed and massacred by the survivors of Håkon's men. Yeah, Håkon does seem to be quite sneaky, because also, when the Norwegians sail away, he unleashed some archers on retreating Norwegians, which doesn't seem like a very sort of good Viking conduct to me to fire against your enemy as they're retreating. No. But either way, the following year, we've now gotten to 1066, Harold Hardrada tried to claim the English throne and didn't do very well and died at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. This kind of ruined the power of, of the Norwegians for a while and also is usually seen as the date that ends the Viking Age. As we know, this isn't an exact science, but you know, it seems a sensible date. Not only is this the year that's used to define the end of the Viking Age, but it's also the end of Stenshiel. The Swedish king dies in his bed, as we know, survived by two sons from his marriage to Eamon's daughter. These sons are called Halsten and Inge, and just lock those names away for now because they will be important again later. Yes, and at his death in general, it can be seen that Sweden had once again managed to at least somewhat keep the balance of power stable in Scandinavia, making sure that these warring Danes and Norwegians didn't get too much power for themselves and didn't invade Sweden. So that's a, a good success. And according to legend, Stenshiel was buried in a royal hill near this place that he loved so much, Levena in Vestergötland. And that's pretty much it. But what happens next? Because there's no direct succession between fathers and sons. So this is when the system starts to fall apart a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Now this is when the real mayhem begins. So strap yourselves in, lovely listeners. So we are up to 1066. 
According to Adam of Bremen, a huge civil war erupts with two main contenders for the throne. So we are now in 1066 to 1067 and we have two claimants to the throne, Eric and Eric. Which, you'll note, are not the sons of Stenshield. They're just these two seemingly random Erics who haven't been named anywhere before in the sources, and they just appear. There's this short war, but one that came with disastrous consequences, as Adam of Bremen tells us. He says that the two Erics struggled for the throne, and all the Swedish nobles are said to have fallen in the fighting. The two kings also perished. Conditions in the kingdom were changed, and Christianity was disturbed to a high degree. The bishops that the Archbishop of Bremen had anointed for this land stayed back home due to fear of persecutions. Only the Bishop of Skorna attended the churches in Vesterjotland, and the Swedish chief Gnifa fortified the people in Christianity. Unfortunately, nothing more is known about the two Eriks. Really, there is only that paragraph in Adam of Bremen. Yeah, and a couple of sagas literally just say, after the death of the two Eriks, yeah. that's it. There's no more information. Some modern historians have suggested that one of them was a Christian son of Stainshil and the other was a pagan, but there isn't really any evidence to suggest that. Seeing as Adam of Bremen and some sagas calls them both kings, it might be that one was proclaimed king of Svealand and one of Vestergötland. This is a pattern that we'll see coming up, but we don't know for sure if that was the case this time. It is also possible one or both were pagans due to Adam of Bremen mentioning the difficulty of being Christian during this year and that Christianity took a bit of a step back. But yeah, we're done. Next. Next is uh, when things really do start to become a bit more complicated because there's this power vacuum. There's been a, a year and a half or a year and a bit of civil war where everything's falling to pieces. And the kingdom of Sweden is split up after this civil war. And a lot of what we'll talk about next is really highly debated. There isn't anyone who knows the right answer. So we've tried to put it all together in a way that makes sense. And that seems to be the way that most modern historians put it together. It's just that nobody can say for sure that this is the way it all happened. So we'll start this part of the story in Svealand. In an addition to his history, Adam of Bremen says that Halsten, one of the sons of Stenshiel, was elected king of Sweden after the violent death of two pretenders, whom he'd previously named Eric and Eric. He's presumably calling him the king of Sweden because he was declared king in the province of Svealand, not because he was also supported by the people living in Vestergötland, because, as we'll see shortly, someone else is reigning there. Literally the only thing we know about Halsten's reign is that he was deposed shortly after taking power and replaced by a prince brought over to Sweden from the Rus. He wasn't killed, he was just removed and disappears from the sources. Wow, that's like 20 seconds in history. That must be one of the most fleeting marks any ruler has ever left on Swedish history. Yeah, pretty much. Modern lists give him a reign of anything up to three years for that 20 seconds of information. But this all comes from one quote of Adam, which says, when he was presently removed. So there's no clue as to how long this actually takes. Presumably not very long, because there's no information of him doing anything. So maybe it wasn't three years, maybe it was just, it could be three months. We, we don't really know. Three hours, just came in, had tea, left again. Yes, uh, we can presume that he was at least pro-Christianity because they're removing him to bring in someone who they hope is more pagan. Oh. And so this is now 1068, maybe, maybe 1069 or maybe 1070, and we're still just in Svealand. We're leaving Vestergötland for the moment. So uh, who comes in his place? So in his place, the people bring in a Rus prince called Arnund Gordske. So he's brought in by the Swedes in Svealand. Apart from being another Anund, name we've heard before, the Gordske is a modern addition, meaning he came from Gardariki, 
which was one of the Scandinavian names for the Kievan Rus region. Interestingly, Adam of Bremen relates that as a Christian, he refused to carry out the public sacrifice of the Norse gods at a formal ceremony, presumably at the temple of Uppsala that Steinschied persuaded the Christian bishops to leave alone a few years ago. So on und Gordske, he doesn't want to carry out this public sacrifice. So he was then promptly deposed. Another one bites the dust, as <laughs> yeah, the Queen say. song says. Adam of Bremen says that Arnund left the thing rejoicing because he had been found worthy to suffer disgrace in the name of Jesus. So he's happy because this is him being martyred, not in a killing way, but he's losing all his power because he's standing up for Christianity. Yeah. This must have happened shortly after the completion of Adam of Bremen's Chronicles in the 1070s, because he's writing this at the time, and as I mentioned previously, Adam comes back to his text after he's finished it and adds in extra information that he's found out since he was writing these particular chapters in what historians call scolia, or additions, or annotations. And so it's really amazing for us to have these updated tiny bits of information because this is technically after he's finished writing the book, um, so that's really nice for us to know. And that also helps us date this event because we know that he finished writing the book in around the 1070s. So it's, it makes it slightly easier for the historians to add things together in the right timeline. Yeah, it's like a second edition once the first edition sells out in the first week. Uh, a small side note, Adam of Bremen is actually writing his history, like we said, right now in the timeline. And not just is he now a contemporary of what he's writing about, he is also visiting King Sven Estridsson in Denmark, who's still reigning. And so he gets a lot of direct information about this period from the Danish king, who relates, amazingly, that he knows how large Sweden is firsthand. Adam says that Sven told him I myself found this out a while ago, when I fought for 12 years in those regions under King Arn und Jakob. I love this. This is so cool. This shows you that Adam of Bremen wasn't just hanging around in Bremen, writing stuff that was happening miles and miles away. He's there talking to the Danish king. So if anybody knows what's going on, the Danish king should. Obviously, he's giving a bit of a biased slant to things, but he is actually right there getting information. Unfortunately, though, this does mean we're going to see the end of uh, Adam of Bremen in this episode because, he, yeah, he's writing now about these things. So this source that we've been using for probably a dozen episodes or so now is going to disappear. Yeah, I think we should just take a moment and say thank you to Adam of Bremen for being such a wealth of a very dubious bias and dubious knowledge. I mean, he was very clearly just favouring anyone who's have helped Christianity and helped the missionaries in Sweden. He wrote that all them, they were great, and he wrote, wrote loads about them, and then if there weren't people he liked, he just d didn't write about them. So, But at least it's easier when your bias is shown like that, rather than uh, hiding it and you're having to guess. At least now we know. True, true. And uh, like Chris said, we have mentioned him a lot, so thank you very much, Adam of Bremen. But yes, that was another king summed up in pretty much a paragraph. They're falling away quite quickly now. Three kings that essentially did very little. Taking over the title of King of Sweden is a man who seems to have quietly spent the last five or six years just ruling in Westergötland, not caring enough about the King of Sweden title but claiming his own territory and keeping himself to himself, pretty much. This man is called Håkon Røde, or Håkon the Red. Yes, and the same annotation to the histories of the Archbishop of Bremen we just mentioned by Adam also says that Håkon was elected after this Arnon Gorska had been rejected as king. So this is presumably meaning elected king of Sweden at this point, because he's already mm. king in Västergötland. 
At his enthronement ceremony, he was forced to take the mother of young Olaf in marriage. Uh, unfortunately, Adam doesn't tell us who this Olaf is because there's so many of them around at the time. Or who his mother was. No, that's true. But some historians suggest that this Olaf is the Olaf who is king of Norway at the time. Someone who we don't have time to talk about because there's so much other yeah. stuff going on. But what we do need to do now is a little bit of detective work and piece together the various bits of the puzzle that tell you why we're so certain that this is the order of things and that this Hawkon was king in Vest to Jotland first. The only definitive piece of information we have about Hawkon is that he reigned for 13 years. And this comes from the same law from the 1200s we keep mentioning, the Vestergjotland King's List Law, which says that Hawkon reigned for 13 winters. And if you're looking at the list of kings of Sweden, that doesn't really make sense at this time, because there isn't a 13-year gap he can fit in between all the other kings of Sweden. So if it means he ruled for 13 winters, that doesn't necessarily mean all of that time he was king of Sweden. No, it could be, however, if he actually ruled over Vestergötland, but not Svealand, after the Erik and Erik civil war, then the 13 years could fit in. This is not only mentioned in a few sagas, but will also place the end of his reign as 1079, which is, spoiler, when the next king of Sweden start his reign. So a number of sagas back this up too. So that is how we can get the pieces of this puzzle to fit together. Magnus Barefoot saga, which is a part of Snorri Strulesson's Heimskringla, says that Håkon is a direct successor to Steinskil, presumably skipping the anarchy of the two Eriks. The saga says, Steinskil, the Swedish king, died about the same time as the two heralds fell in England, and the king who came after him in Svitjod was called Håkon. Svitjod is a name sometimes used for Sweden. Similarly, the Havara story also says that Håkon succeeds Stenskil. This is presumably also just talking about Vestergötland, which means we can still have the stories with Halstein and then Onungårdske briefly having the throne in Svealand. Yeah, so most people seem to accept this position as Håkon being the first king in Vestergötland after Stenskil. And then from then on, any time between 1070 and 1075, also being king of Svealand and therefore king of all of Sweden. After the chaos of Halstein and Arnund reigning for so short a time, Håkon was probably in a good position to then expand his realm once these two were removed from power as everything's falling apart over in Svealand and so someone like him with a little bit of power somewhere else can just come in and take over relatively easily. But unfortunately, once again, that's all we know yeah. about Håkon. We can maybe deduce that he was a little bit more tolerant to the pagan priests at Uppsala because he wasn't removed himself, but that's only a guess. Maybe because he'd been king in Vestergötland for so long, he had troops that could suppress the pagans, or maybe he made a deal with them. But we, we have nothing that can back up that statement. It's just a suggestion from some historians. Either way, he dies in 1079 and the next king enters the stage. They just keep coming. They do indeed. And this next story is sort of two stories in one. And it's really interesting. We can imagine that if this took place in the 1600s or something where there were far more sources, this next character would be known as one of the most fascinating people in Swedish history. He's just relegated to sort of a paragraph in textbooks because we don't really know too much about him, but as is the lot of some people. True. The person in question is called Inge the Elder. Sadly, like Chris said, we don't have many details about him, but we do know a few quite interesting things. This new king, Inge, is the other son of Stenskil and Emund the Gamle's daughter, so we now have, again, a strong connection to previous rulers. The kingdom was, of course, still quite unstable, and it seemed that Inge's main power base was in Vestergötland, as one of the earliest sources that mention his reign calls him Rex 
Gauturum, king of the Geats from Götaland. The first thing to be mentioned in his reign is something that adds to the sort of general intrigue of the period. Pope Gregory VII writes a letter to Inge in 1080 where he is called king of the Swedes, so that's a helpful piece of information for us when we try to date the various reigns at the time. However, what is more interesting is in another letter that is typically dated to 1081, Pope Gregory writes to King Inge and King A, as in the letter of the alphabet, A. In the letter, he commands the kings to pay their tithes, or a sort of tax to support the church, and also send men to Rome to be trained as priests. Wow, this is super interesting and also frustrating. King A. Who is this King A? <laughs> Modern historians think that this is a reference to his brother Halstein, or potentially to Hawkon, who has supposedly just died. We can't find out why, as neither of these names begin with an A, um, so we're just going to have to trust these but historians. But A and H are fairly similar. Yeah, true. Maybe the Pope just had bad handwriting. Maybe he did, um, but yeah, this is the consensus. It's one of these two people. More seem to think that it was his brother Halstein, and the Havara saga actually says this explicitly. Hawkon's reign is generally given quite a specific time period, so this also seems it would be more likely that he reigned before Inga's. That's how the dates seem to fall together properly. Although, of course, it could just mean that Inga started reigning slightly earlier, sharing power with Hawkon, so we don't really know, but there is the suggestion that it is... Halstein coming back once his brother is king. There is also another odd suggestion that Arnond Gorska and Inga were the same person, as several sources mention Inga as a fervent Christian, and just assuming that just because Arnond Gorska was also a Christian, then they're the same person. Mm -hmm. That just seems very odd when we know that Stenshiel had a son who became king. It seems a bit odd to try and make two people into one. Yeah. As Chris says, it seems much more sensible and likely that once Inge is king, his brother Hasdain would be asked back in some capacity or another, as we know that there is a tradition of family members sharing power, going back to Erik Segosel and Ulrich Schötkonung co-reigning in the last years of uh, Erik Segosel's reign. So we're going to give our stamp of approval for this period being a co-rule between Halstein and Inge and not something between Håkon and Inge. A brotherly kingdom at this point. But don't get too comfortable with the situation because <laughs> the next thing that happens is another religious confrontation. In perhaps the early 1080s, usually dated to around 1084, Inga was forced to abdicate, again, someone else abdicating, uh, abdicate his throne because of his disrespect for the traditions of the pagan leaders. Hmm. Another abdication and removal. Once again, Inga, yeah, he's declined to take part in these pagan rituals at the temple in Uppsala, something that was called the Blut, or the Blood Sacrifice. A new king, Blutsvein, or Svein the Sacrificer, was thus elected king in his place. There's no mention of Halstein or Hawkon again at this time, so they presumably died before mm. this happened. So he was only ruling with his brother for a couple of years before Halstein dies. Mm. The Havara saga gives us a bit more detail about this Sven, Inga's abdication, and how Inga was sent into exile in Vestergötland. A quick note before we read this out, our version of the Havara saga was actually translated from the Icelandic into English by Christopher Tolkien, the son of J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, wow, a fun, fun fact. Yes. So we have a Tolkien to thank for these next words. So yeah. uh, would you like to read them out? I will. The son of Stenshiel was called Inge, whom the Swedes took for king next after Håkon. Inge was king for a long time, well-liked and a good Christian. He put down sacrificing in Sweden and ordered all the people of the land to become Christian. But the Swedes had too strong a belief in their heathen gods 
and held to their ancient ways. King Inge's wife was a woman called Mer. Her brother's name was Sven. No man was more dear to King Inge than he, and Sven became thereby the mightiest man in Sweden. But the Swedes thought that King Inge had infringed their rights under the ancient laws of the land, when he found fault with many things that Stenshiel, his father, had let be, and at a certain assembly which the Swedes held with King Inge, they gave him the choice of two things, either to observe the ancient law or else to give up his throne. Then King Inge spoke and said that he would not leave the true faith, whereat the Swedes cried out and pelted him with stones and drove him from the law assembly. Ouch. <laughs> sort of all quite nice and flowery description and then it's pelted him with stones. Sven, the king's kinsman, remained behind at the assembly and he offered to make sacrifice for the Swedes if they would grant him the kingdom. All agreed to Sven's offer, and he was accepted as king over all the Swedish realm. Then a horse was led forth to the assembly, hewn in pieces, and divided up for eating, and the sacrificial tree was reddened with its blood. Thereafter, all the Swedes cast off the Christian faith, and sacrifices were instituted, and they drove King Inge away. He departed into western Jötaland. For three years, Sven the Sacrificer was king of the Swedes. So, Inga didn't last very long. Uh, no, and he was pelted by stones. He's probably got a few bruises. Bruised and exiled to Vester Jutland. It must have been pretty humiliating to be replaced by your brother-in-law, um, especially when... Uh, he was your good friend. Yeah, he was your good friend and most loyal follower, apparently. But as we know from history, that tends to be the sort of people <laughs> who like to take over from you. When we look a bit further, there's no mention of Sven in the Regnor lists that are attached to this Vestjutland law in the 1200s, which suggests that his rule didn't reach Vestjutland, where Inge was staying in exile, and so Inge could keep hold of his claim of the title of King of Sweden, even though Sven is calling himself that back up in Uppsala. There's no more information about this Sven, apart from this bit of background that he'd become the strongest personality in the kingdom before Inga was overthrown. Exactly. This is pretty much all we know once again, because according to the Havara saga, like Chris said, Sven didn't get long to rule. It didn't take too long before Inge managed to build up enough forces and decide to kill the pagan Sven. And this is another quote. Yes. King Inge went with his own bodyguard and some followers, though it was only a small force. He rode east across Smorland and into eastern Jutland and so into Sweden. He rode by day and night and came upon Sven unawares in the early morning. They seized the house over their heads and set it on fire and burnt all the company who were inside. There was a landed man called Fjörf who was burnt there. He had been in the following of Sven the Sacrificer. Sven came out and was cut down, and so Inga took the kingship of the Swedes anew and restored the Christian faith. He ruled the realm till the day of his death and died of a sickness. King Stenshiel had a son called Halsten, and he was king together with his brother Inga. Yet yeah, a similar account appears in the Orkney saga, but in this text, Sven remains inside and is burnt to death. So let's read that slightly wacky translation from the Orkney saga. Christianity then was young and newly planted in Sweden. Many men still dabbled in ancient lore and were persuaded that by such means they were able to ascertain future events. King Inge was a good Christian man and loathed those that meddled in ancient superstitious lore and made strenuous efforts to abolish the evil customs which for a long time had accompanied heathenism. But the chiefs murmured loudly if they were reproved for their evil habits and at last, matters went so far that the people elected another king, Sven, the brother of the queen, 
who permitted them to make sacrifices and was therefore called sacrificing Sven. Inge had to flee from him to Vestergötland, but their dealings ended thus, as King Inge caught Sven by surprise in a house and burnt the house and him in it. After this, he subdued the whole country and uprooted many wicked customs. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is uh, Inga the Elder Part 2, the return of the king or <laughs> something. Inga is back. According to the Vestiotland law, Inga ruled Sweden with virility and he never broke the laws that had been accepted in the districts. So that's nice of him. Then there's a long period of silence as Inge presumably just comfortably gets on reigning and kinging. We have no information about insurrections, pagan revolts, invasions from Norway, or anything like that, so presumably it was pretty calm. Around 1100, Inge and his queen appear in the sources once again, although his wife is now known as Helena. This clearly Christian name for Helena is probably quite important, as she was previously known as Mare, as also said in her passage, a very traditional Scandinavian name at the time. Her brother, of course, became the king as a staunch pagan, this Sven, so maybe Helena chose Christianity over pagan rituals and sided with her husband in this time rather than her pagan brother. Either way, she remains on the scene and is Inga's wife as long as we have evidence for them being alive. This is because around 1100 they founded Vreta Abbey, Sweden's first abbey near present-day Linköping. The abbey also housed Sweden's first nunnery and is one of the oldest in all of Scandinavia. It was a Benedictine abbey and Pope Paschal II was the one who ordered its construction, apparently. Yeah, we will talk a bit more about this in our next episode uh, when we're going to focus on Christianity in this period and how that has an influence on how Swedish society developed. So don't worry that we're just passing over it quite quickly quickly now. But in this period, the church was also laying the groundwork to create a sort of Scandinavian archbishopric down in Lund. Part of the preparation was creating a formal list of Swedish sees and provinces in around 1100, uh, which gives an idea of what Inge's realm looked like and how far Christianity was spreading. So this gives the seas as Skara, Leonga, Capuinga, Tuna, Stirgin, Sigtuna, and Arosa. We've already mentioned Skara and Sigtuna quite a lot in the podcast, thanks to the adventures of all the bishops that Adam of Bremen sent. Historians looking at Christianity in Sweden, or actually in Scandinavia in general, have concluded that Leonga and Stringin are probably the towns of Linköping and Stringnes, whilst the others are harder to identify. They might not have been individual towns, but more like overall areas or perhaps counties that had a lot of Christians living there. We don't really know. Attached to this list of the seas and provinces is a list of religious areas that were part of the kingdom, which is too long to read it all out, that they do include Estonia and Finland. Interesting. And, yeah, and people have taken this to mean that they were actually more like ambitions for where the church <laughs> should expand to or where there were some a few missionaries heading to rather than that they belong to Inga's kingdom. More of a wish list than a factually accurate... Yeah, the Pope's wish list. Um, it is known that one of Inga's daughters was married to a prince of Novgorod, so this could maybe very potentially explain some sort of eastward focus from Inga at this time, although, of course, this would be nothing new if we'd seen this eastern focus from the kings of Sweden for the last hundred years or so, so that doesn't necessarily mean that there were Swedish Christians in Finland and Estonia at this time. Also in around 1100, when Inge is busy founding Vreta Abbey, there was more fighting between the three Nordic countries. I am so glad. Actually, we're recording this on the day that Sweden placed Denmark in the finals of uh, the Handball World Cup. 
this is a big thing. Handball's a big sport in Scandinavia, so we're all getting excited for the final. And I am so happy that these days we confine our our fighting to various sports because there is just so much fighting between the Nordic countries at this period in history. We haven't really given a running commentary on Norway and Denmark throughout this period, as a lot of the time it isn't too relevant, but just for a bit of context, let's get up to date of where we are right now. In 1076, King Sven Estridsson, Adam of Bremen's friend, he dies after being on the throne for 29 years. Perhaps unluckily for the kingdom, he only had one legitimate child who also died young, but he had 19 illegitimate children with many different women, and five of these would become king of Denmark after his death. He was quite busy. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. First up is his son, Harold the Soft, which sounds like he's a detergent or a fabric softener. Harold the Soft, who only hung around for four years, his half-brother Knut IV then takes over, but a rebellion is begun by a brother called Olaf. This Olaf was arrested by another brother called Eric and sent into exile in Flanders. This didn't stop the rebellion in Denmark, though, as Knut was killed in front of the altar of a church by peasants rebelling in 1086. He did then become the first Danish king to be made a saint, so at least that's something. After Knut dies, Olaf is released from exile in Flanders and returns home to become king of Denmark. His brother Erik is pretty worried at this point because he was the one to exile Olaf, so this Erik runs into exile in Sweden and escapes. Olaf reigns for nearly 10 years in quite disastrous circumstances with lots of crop failure and famine. He actually gets the name Olaf Hunger because of how hungry his people were at this time. So that's not very nice for Denmark at all. In 1067 or so, he'd actually married Ingegerd, a daughter of Harald Hardrada, and remember her for a few weeks' time because she becomes very important in the story. But this Olaf dies in 1095, and his brother, living in Sweden... Eric becomes king, and he's still around at the point where we reach 1100. So that's quite confusing, but yeah. five illegitimate brothers all fighting for the throne, and it ends up with one who has been living in Sweden for a while coming back to take the throne of Denmark. Pretty crazy in Denmark uh, this time. It's much simpler in Norway, thankfully. After Harald Hardrada dies at Stamford Bridge in 1066, his two sons reigns for a while before Magnus Barefoot becomes king in 1093. He is the grandson of Harald Hardrada. This Magnus wasn't too happy about the current state of the Norwegian-Swedish border, and so simply entered Dalsland and Vesterjötterland in 1099, the most westernly counties of Sweden, and he started a war that Snorri Sturluson tells us about in the saga of Magnus Barefoot. Magnus was claiming that all land west of Lake Vernon, which is a substantial chunk of Swedish land, was his. So obviously, Inge, the Swedish king, wasn't too happy about that. Inge began raising an army, but it was taking some time. Whilst this was happening, the Norwegians sailed to an island on Lake Vernon and set up a fort there. As winter was arriving, Magnus returned to Norway, leaving his fort to stake his claim to the lake. Soon enough, Inga arrives at Lake Vernon just as the water was freezing over. A short battle takes place, which Inga wins, and the Swedish king tells the surviving Norwegians to return to Norway, leaving him free to take back control of the land that Magnus had just took. Now, Magnus wasn't happy about that either, so as soon as the rivers thawed in the spring of 1100, he returned to Sweden with a large army. As they marched near a river, the Norwegians were ambushed by the Swedes, and Magnus had to flee with the Swedes pursuing and killing all they could. A great massacre supposedly took place next to a waterfall, so oh. that would have been quite impressive to see. Yeah. Um, not the massacring part, but the waterfall. <laughs> 
One small detail I like from this saga episode is that Magnus was apparently wearing a bright red double or a jacket over his armour and so was really noticeable in the middle of the battle. One of his commanders had a son who looked a bit like the king, so he rode over to him and asked him to borrow his jacket so the Swedes would think that it was him that was the king and chase him away instead. This apparently worked as Magnus managed to escape back to a boat and sail to Norway just in time before he was captured. And oh. the, the son of the commander survived as well. So, oh. uh, yeah. That's a nice bit of detail there. Uh, the war is formally concluded at the peace treaty in Kungahella. If you remember, this was the same place that Arnold Jakob made war plans with King Olaf II of Norway in a previous episode. So... It's quite the place for royal visitors. Eric of Denmark also attends this peace treaty and the three kings decide that each of them was to have possession of the realm that his forefathers had and each of the kings was to make recompense to the other for the booty made by him and for the destruction of life. So I think going back over the last 10 years or so is probably going to make itself even out <laughs> yeah. quite well, I think. But they're saying they should just go back to the old borders. Yeah, th their forefathers. So, yeah, pretty much as it's been for a long time. Magnus also agreed to marry Margrethe or, or Margaret, a daughter of Inge. She was given the name Fredkulla or Peace Woman. That's quite a nice name. Yeah, I don't know how nice it is to be like a pawn in a political I, game, though. I was just going to say, you get a great name, but you're also being sold as a political dealing, so and it's I, not very nice. You know the phrase, smoking a peace pipe? They're, they're just smoking a peace woman. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, it's not nice. No, it's not very nice, but we'll definitely come back to her as well, because uh, all this comes back to uh, haunt the Swedes a bit later on, ah. these uh, various marriages and things. It gets quite complicated. So that's why we're name-checking them now. Yeah. But yes, this is it. Peace at last between the three kingdoms. Uh, take bets on how long this will last. <laughs> how long's a handball game? <laughs> yeah. One final thing from this peace treaty, which is really quite fun, uh, makes these characters come alive a little bit, is a really fun description of the three kings. So it says that people said that never had there been seen more princely men than these three kings. King Inga was the tallest in stature and the stoutest of them all, and to all he seemed the most majestic in appearance. But King Magnus seemed the most striking and active, whereas Eric was the most handsomest. But all three of them were large, handsome, distinguished-looking and eloquent. They parted when these agreements had been made. Wow. Sounds a bit like a Donald Trump autobiography. <laughs> or it sounds like, sort of, I know uh, women from other countries sometimes find Scandinavian men incredibly attractive for the sort of traditionally tall, blonde, quite stoutly built. It sounds a bit like there was just someone writing home to their friend. Like, I've seen this one Danish guy, one Norwegian and one Swede, and they were all really handsome. Yeah, but this is sort of it for the rest of Inga's life and uh, mm -hmm. the, the history part of this episode. Yeah. Um, the Havara saga says that Inga dies of old age and that he kept the throne until his death. We don't know the exact year, of course, but his successor, Philip, who we know died in 1118, is said to have only ruled briefly. So for reasons that we're we'll talking about in a future episode, most historians date Inga dying to 1110. As we mentioned, he was married to Helena, who outlives him, but sadly their son, Rongvald, died before he could succeed his father on the throne. The couple had three daughters, one being Christina, who we briefly mentioned had married Prince Mstislav of Novgorod, later Grand Duke of Kiev. There was also Margaret, who is now obviously married to Magnus Barefoot of Norway because of the peace treaty, and their final daughter was named Catherine, and she was married to Danish Prince Bjorn Ironside. So they were certainly using their daughters to strengthen these Scandinavian or these uh, greater, wider alliances, something that will certainly impact our story as we go forward. But yeah, we've covered quite a lot this time. I hope you were able to keep up. We promise it won't be quite this bad and messy from now on and 
from now on we have a bit more detail on some of the kings or in fact of uh, of most of them so just to remind yourself we roughly reached the year 1110 now yes we started this episode with quite a lot of information about Stenshiel, the founder of this mini dynasty and he was praised for his pragmatic attitude towards the pagans in sweden and also had a small war against harald hardrada unfortunately his attitude towards the pagans caused a lot of problems going forward and after he died a brief but bloody civil war starts in Svealand as eric and eric fight it out to the death the next two kings are deposed in quick succession. Halsten, the son of Stenshiel and Arnold Gorska, who was brought over from Kiev. This gives Harkon den Röda, the Harkon the Red, a chance to become king of all Sweden after he'd been hanging out just ruling Vestergötland since Stenshiel died. Then after Harkon died, in came Inga, who brings his brother Halsten along for a bit of a co-rule, until once again they are deposed as they refuse to sacrifice to pagan gods, leaving Blutsvein, or Svein the Sacrificer, to come in for three years whilst Inga is exiled, until Inga returns, kills Svein, and reigns for another 20 years or so. Yeah, wow, oh, that was an excellent, nice, quick summary there. Yeah. In the next episode, we're going to let the kings and that side of politics uh, rest for a bit. And in the next episode, we're going to talk more in depth about Christianity, because this is really becoming a permanent feature of Swedish society now. And we have to understand certain developments in Christianity to understand how Swedish society develops from now on and, and really Christianity will be a fundamental part of life in Sweden and of Swedish governance until pretty much into the 20th century. So that's all to come in the next episode. Yeah, and we've got a lovely Abby to tell you all about. So. <laughs> we do. Uh, but until next time, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're at Flatpack Sweden on Twitter and we're a Flatpack History of Sweden on Facebook. Uh, you can also get in touch with us via email on flatpackhistorysweden, or one word, at gmail.com. But before we go, we've had another lovely review. Yes, this one's from Russia on iTunes. It's a five-star review which says, I love history and I've started to be more interested in Sweden recently because of my friends. Unfortunately, when I asked them, they said their history is not interesting and that's hard to comprehend when you're Russian and you learn history from an early age and you're taught to appreciate your heritage. Thank you for such a wonderful experience you give me. You're amazing storytellers and you actually prove that Swedish history is interesting. I love what you do. Oh, thank you so much. That was such a kind review. Yes, and I'm going to try my best to say the username. I think it's Pokoynik, which means dead body or corpse Ooh. in Russian, according to my friend Marat. Well, thank you so much, dead body. And uh, there will be many, many instances in the episodes to come when Russia and Sweden will... Uh, cross paths in history so uh, stay with us for those moments when our country's histories intertwine with each other so until next time uh, have a great day evening week month whatever you're enjoying at the moment and we'll see you next time and go sweden in the handball go sweden in the handball <laughs> hey do hey do oh quick edit before the episode ends we recorded this over a month ago and sweden lost the handle uh. boo sad times um see you next time By any means necessary. when napoleon laid boulogne for a year Zachary Davis, Jane Redfin, Benjamin Jacobs, I'm Eric Marcus, Dan McManamy, Sly and I, Free, Rudyard Lynch, Susan Archery, Alex Clifford, BT Newberg, Raven Forrest, Chris Galto, Stephen Guerra, Elsa and Chris, David Crowther, and I, Liz Covard, will be speaking alongside 40 other great content creators. This will be an event that you don't want to miss. Intelligent Speech is back. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting the best independent educational content creators with their listeners. This year's Intelligent Speech Conference will be held on Saturday, April 24th, 
starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Time or for our friends across the Atlantic, 3 p.m. London Time. Tickets will be $30, but are available for only $20 as an early bird special. You can get them online at intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop.